You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Welcome to number three in a series called the COVID Practitioner Challenge. I'm John Scott, and this is an INCJ podcast and YouTube. Now, COVID-19 seems to be lasting forever, doesn't it? It's certainly presenting a tough challenge to frontline services, not just in the health and social sectors, but in criminal justice too. At INCJ, we wanted to find out how people working in prisons, probation, police, or with victims internationally, were handling the issues around COVID-19. So we've started a series of conversations with criminal justice workers to ask about their experience of the crisis. Our hope is that sharing answers will help find solutions and fresh ideas and highlight how practice will be changed in the longer term. If you want to follow the series, you'll find it on our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or on Twitter at INTCJ Network. Let me introduce two probation officers from Ireland, Kira Harris and Connor Kelly. Welcome, Kira and Connor. Now, tell us where you're based and uh, whether you're working from home today. Let's start with Kira. Where are you based, Kira? Hi, um, I'm based in Haymarket in Dublin. Um, I'm working from home today, as you can see. Um, but yeah, mainly based in, in Smithfield in, in Dublin. Okay, Connor, whereabouts are you? So I'm based in Southside YPP, um, and today I was in the Children's Court. Um, so I'm kind of based between a few different offices on the south side of Dublin. And what's YPP stand for? So sorry, that's a young person's probation. Yeah, and are you at home at the minute too? Um, I am, I am. I just got home there about an hour and a half ago. <laughs> okay, <So>. okay. <laughs> Okay, right. Well, let's find out a, a bit about your current roles. What's, what's, what job do you have at the moment, Kira? So I kind of have a dual role. Um, I suppose I'm on the court liaison team in, in Dublin in the main offices in Smithfield. So I suppose that team in itself has a couple of different roles. There are two people on the team that are based uh, in the courts, in the criminal uh, the criminal courts, uh, the courts of justice in um, the CCJ in Dublin. Um, myself, I'm based in the drug treatment court in Dublin. And then the remainder team um, mainly work in the office doing a assessments for the circuit court and um, so that's the circuit courts all around Ireland and um, I do those assessments myself and then I also work as the liaison probation officer in the drug treatment court then in Dublin so it's a bit of a mixed bag um, there there I suppose there are two different kind of roles I suppose in the sense that the drug treatment court is a district court um, and I suppose all the clients that are on that uh, program that's in the court would have their own probation officer and I act as the contact between those probation officers and the court um, and then the circuit court piece is completing probation reports um, assessing people uh, with for suitability for supervision and community service um, that are before the circuit courts. So two, um, two different roles. Yeah, and the circuit court is the senior court. So the cases are more serious and the crimes are uh, needing a lot more attention and difficulty, yes? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they would. They'd have um, more, I suppose, um, harsher sentences, um, mandatory sentences than, than the district court. Yeah. OK. So, Connor, what's what's your current role? So with myself at the moment, um, I'm working in YPP. So primarily we would work with young people who come before the children's court. Now, there is sometimes crossover um, because we stay working with uh, the young people when they become adults as well, um, if, if they're known to us, um, we stay working with them. And sometimes that can involve, um, you know, it, it can involve doing reports for the district courts or the circuit court as well. Um, so I suppose very, very similar to Kira, you know, doing reports, uh, doing assessments, um, you know, a typical day. There probably isn't really a typical day. We're kind of on the go. Every day is a little bit different. Um, 
you know, we might be doing core duty and um, meeting young people in in different locations, you know, various probation offices, um, residential units. We we tend to use um probation projects quite quite a lot and especially over the last kind of 12 months they've been really kind of useful mm. um, you know and it, it tends to be a little bit more uh, formal and they can be really good places to to meet with young people um, you know and, and sometimes some of my young people they'd be in residential care so I, I would tend to to kind of maybe meet them in residential units as well so it's, it's kind of a, a bit of a mix so no no one day is the same Okay, we'll we'll come back to that. Um, but I'm interested. Um, have you had lots of other roles in probation before you had this one working with young people? I have. I I, I suppose I've worked in a few different uh, probation teams. I've I've worked in community service. Uh, I, I worked in Mountjoy for a number of years, and I worked in community teams as well. Um, and I and I worked in child and family social work prior to coming to probation. So I'm kind of about 14 years experience uh, and I've been in the YPP now the last two and a half years. Mm. And so the, it's a good mix. Indeed. And this job with young people is characterised by being very much a community orientated job, is it? It would. It would, John. I mean, you, you tend to to be kind of on the go a lot. Um, and you, I mean, that's why I was, I was kind of only just thinking... The first lockdown was probably the hardest because we, we tended to be doing a lot of contact via phone. Um, and with the young people that you're working with, that can be quite difficult and quite challenging. Um, you know, if, if you've built up a good relationship with them to kind of suddenly switch to phone contact, that was really difficult. And then equally, you know, um, just thinking about the first lockdown uh, in particular, we, we, we tended to kind of do a lot of our reports um, via phone contact. And that was quite challenging, you know, because you, you had no rapport with them. I think it's a lot easier when you're kind of meeting uh, people in person. And, and I think especially with younger people. Uh, it, it might be easier if you've already met them to continue a conversation by phone or video, but to start from scratch is, is much harder, isn't it? It is, John. No, it, it's, 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 you know, cause I think, you know, when you, when you meet people in person, you can build that rapport. Um, and, and especially actually with a lot of the younger people, you know, they mightn't have had any previous involvement with probation. So they don't really know what probation is, you know, and, and that might be where there might be a difference with, with say care. And, um, you know, so, you know, some of the, the people that, Kira might be working with, they might have had previous probation involvement and they might have a general, you know, good idea about what we do and, and what the role of probation is. Whereas with the younger uh, people who might be, you know, just referred, let's say, through the, the children's court, they might be, you know, sometimes they can present as quite suspicious about probation and who you are and what your role is. So I think it's much easier to kind of clarify your role when you actually meet with people in person. Mm. Let's pick that up with Kira then. So uh, you work with uh, writing reports for the higher courts, which are often very serious matters, but also with drugs related offenders. Uh, have you found uh, it hard to use new technology in engaging with offenders? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that the thing, like Connor was kind of saying, doing the doing a full assessment by phone was something that was really tricky at the start. I think it was something that a lot of us, just as social workers, we we kind of struggled with not having that face to face contact, not knowing who the clients are, um, especially for new referrals. That was tricky, um, like Connor said, because it's explaining kind of what. The probation service is what the, our role is in the community what the purpose of the reports for for court it's it's a nerve-wracking experience for them and they haven't been known to us before and like connor said a lot of the time with the young people they they might be new nearly every second client they might not have been in probation whereas it is different with adult offenders all my clients are adult offenders and 
they, you know, it, there's, there's a few of them that would have been known to us before and they are easier. I think we would have even had our own nearly ethical concerns about doing full assessments by phone without meeting these people. It could have been anybody answering the phone, really. And, you know, it, it's a very confidential process, really, especially being before the courts and everything else. So doing things by phone was hard. Um, it was mainly during the first lockdown um, that I suppose we had no idea how long this was going to go on for and we had to adapt quite quickly. But again, was this going to be something that was only a few weeks or like a month or two? So, you know, do you bring in all this new technology straight away or not? And I think the service reacted quite quickly in terms of what we needed um, and things have changed now in the sense of, you know, we have straight away, there was always a list, like a high priority list that the service had that those some of those people needed to be seen face to face. Um, and it wasn't really OK to just do phone assessments with those. And they'd be considered, you know, sex offenders um, domestic violence um, offences, uh, juveniles. Like Connor said, a lot of the time you're, you try and prioritise to meet them if they have been known to us. Um, vulnerable clients with mental health issues. Um, even PSSOs coming out from the prison, you know, our our colleagues in the prison haven't really done much working from home at all. So they had to kind of keep going during all of this the whole time and custody reports had to be prioritised as well. So we had that, that, that was the guidance we kind of had. There were certain clients we still need to see face to face where possible. And then obviously the service stepped up in terms of providing safe spaces for us to be able to do that. But the majority has been by phone. Now it's more um, during level five lockdown, anyway, the high restrictions, we've kind of, you know, we try and meet them in person once if we can and do the remainder by phone. I just find myself, my own work, it makes it a lot easier just to at least have one in person and just explain the process to them and build that rapport and then kind of go from there. It's been hard, but I think we've adapted as well as we could. Okay, so I just want to pause a moment and uh, and ask the same sort of question of you about um, the drugs work as I did about about Connor because it strikes me that um, drugs related offenders are, are, are often uh, quite suspicious of authority, for example, uh, and maybe a bit worried about confidentiality. So maybe if you're writing reports or maybe making referrals to the community. Uh, doing that down the telephone line must be really difficult. Yeah, absolutely. So the way with the drug court, how that kind of works, what happened was um, we have the drug treatment court in Dublin. And from March, when we first went into lockdown, that court was closed. So because of the clients and like because they're struggling with addiction issues, they're quite vulnerable in the terms of their own health issues and everything else. And we had to be very conscious of asking these clients to be coming into the court, using public transport, um, you know, all these kind of high risk areas where they could have contracted COVID-19. So we had to take a lot of that into consideration. These were clients that were coming into court every week. Um, when they're on the drug treatment court program, they're expected to be involved in some sort of day program, um, Monday to Friday. We also have a school that's run as part of the drug court. If if they're not doing a day pro program, they might be on, in the school. Otherwise, they're in full time employment. They're also given weekly urine screens. So they had a lot of structure in place and that course and all that kind of closed between March to October of last year. So it was a very long time for those clients to not have that structure in place. And then when it came to new referrals, so like you said, doing reports for people that were only starting on the programme, we had to kind of put a lot of those on hold because we couldn't really assess um, those clients without their consent. So it's slightly different to other courts. When we get a referral in the probation service, once that comes from the court, that's kind of, that is the consent. We can proceed with our assessments. But in the drug court, it's a multidisciplinary team. It's a multidisciplinary approach. So I can go ahead and try and make contact with that person by phone and do my probation report. But the problem was that in order for, our, our team is made up of myself, um, an addiction nurse, an education coordinator, then there's the core coordinator and the registrar, um, a guard. Now that can change every week, the guard, and then there's the judge. But in terms of an assessment, it's myself doing, um, I'll do that initial probation assessment and try and get that case allocated out then to the different community teams for them to, that's who 
to be allocated to them then um, to do a full assessment. Um, I can do that part, but then our nurse, she can't do her assessment regarding treatment um, and what they need without them signing consent in court. So there what happened with no court sitting from March to October, we couldn't really proceed with new referrals because mm-hmm. we couldn't get the consent in court because it has to be uh, in front of a judge. Um, so it is slightly different. So we've really struggled in that sense, not being able to really proceed with those referrals. So what we did was from October on, we'd have kind of, we had some sittings between October and December, and then we'd have some just so we could come in and get clients to sign consent um, and that they could proceed on. And we're looking at different ways that if they have their solicitor present or something that just different ways we can get around that if the actual court doesn't sit but we are hopeful that it might hopefully from from next week actually sit as normal and get back more into routine because we've changed the way the court is run now we've changed the times and stagger okay. times and stuff okay. Kira, i'm interested to ask uh when it was on hold um was this causing real stress for the for the for the clients for the uh were they uh worried about their legal status and was it putting them under particular pressures during this period? Yeah, yeah, massive, massive pressure. I think they really, really struggled. Um, I think all of our clients in probation struggled, but I think in particular, these were clients, like I said, that had a, a really firm structure in place every week, nearly every day, they had something they had to do. And then what happened was all the services had closed because of the restrictions, no urine screens are taking place. So for clients that were, say, only, you know, in the early stages of, of you know, dealing with their own addiction issues, you know, it's 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 easier to obviously use drugs than when you're not being screened and when you don't have a program to go to. I mean, COVID was hard for us. We can only imagine what it was like for those clients that had all these structures and they just they disappeared. So we had to step in really and we had to put other things in place. We would have had a lot more contact with them by phone than we would have. And it's different now. We've we've we do have where the school sends out worksheets and, and that if they're involved in the school and um you know that's why we try and have a lot more phone contact and everything. But it, it, they've really, really struggled. Yeah, mm. it's been very hard for them. Do you have any data about uh any increased rates of non compliance or do you think you've managed to hold on to people successfully? Um, yeah, we have had to, what, what, what happens is there are different stages in the drug court. So you have assessment stage, you would have the bronze, silver and gold phase then. So they're broken down by different um, stages of drug use. Bronze kind of being, you know, heroin use and, and stuff like that and, and amphetamine and then going into silver, um, you know, you'd want to be off all of that altogether. You want to address kind of non-prescribed tablet use and then gold stage you're looking at kind of addressing your cannabis use if that's what's left when you're drug free um aside from prescribed medication you can be on methadone or prescribed tablets if you're completely drug free which is the aim of the drug court you would graduate but if someone has not progressed and is disengaged completely, we would give them a lot of chances. We are trying to encourage them, try and support them through whatever it is that's going on. But it can get to a stage where clients will be what we say is terminated or discharged from the court. And what happens then is that their case goes back to the original court that they were referred from. And um, we tried to hold on to as many as we could. Like normally you'd have about a year in each stage with COVID, we obviously didn't hold that to a firm kind of rule with, with the court not sitting. It wasn't fair and with everything going on. So we when we kind of got back around December, we had to really look at clients and thought, look, who has totally disengaged? And there was numbers, I, I, I think, you know, we normally have around 50 and I think we were down to around 35 at one point. So it, it was it was high enough percent. But now we've been able to take on new referrals. So while there might be some terminations throughout the year, unfortunately, it all kind of happened in one block because we had to kind of we only had a couple of chances to kind of look at those clients and to, you know, some people were asking to nearly come off because they couldn't they couldn't do it anymore with the current 
way that it's being ran. So yeah, we, we did, we had to terminate it. I think there was a, about 15 in the last year, but it all happened at one stage. But normally there might be some, like I said, throughout the year. Um, but at the same time, we would be taking on new referrals. So the numbers would balance out. Um, and now we have been able to take on new referrals now. So we're, our numbers are going back up. Okay. Let's let's give, give similar attention now to um, Connor's work with young people. Um, uh, in a way, you can see how the the pressures of someone who's got an on, ongoing drug problem would be intensified through uh, COVID. Um, and you could say the same is probably true of a young person who's got all the growing up stuff going on and maybe difficulties at home or uh, struggling with school or trying to find a job and things like that. So can can you perhaps describe to us the sorts of experiences that people who were in, coming to your attention, what, what impact COVID was having on their lives, Connor? Well, I, I think actually, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of positives of, of, of COVID, you know, but one thing that I probably did notice within the first kind of two, three months, um, especially with young people that I would have known prior to COVID and who I would have had a good rapport with, was that they and their parents would have been coming to me and saying that their drug use has kind of gotten off and out of control, you know. And I suppose as a result of that, I would have completed referrals down to the Ashling Centre and, um, you know, be an adolescent residential rehabilitation um, center, you know, for a few of the young people that I work with. So I think that was actually quite good. So whatever was kind of happening in the background, it, it probably brought it to the boil almost, maybe sometimes a little bit quicker than it otherwise might have. Um, you know, and, and look, I, I, I think pretty much all of the young people that I referred down there, they did very well when they were in residential treatment. I suppose the issues are sometimes when they return back to their communities, because even if, if they've got the best intentions in the world, they are coming back to the same environment, which I think it's a challenge for, for adults, you know, trying to overcome addiction. But I think especially when you're kind of under 18, you're a younger person, you know, I, th I think it can maybe sometimes be doubly challenging because, you know, your peer group sometimes is your family you know, and it can be very kind of hard to to remove yourself from your friends, and especially if they're kind of actively misusing drugs. You know, you're you're coming straight back into it, and um, you know, and I, you know, I, I think I suppose disproportionately, you know, a lot of the the people that we work with in probation, and, and I'm sure it's the same for our colleagues around Europe and across the world. They they do tend to disproportionately come from more deprived backgrounds. You know, and I think, you know, houses can be quite crowded. You know, there can be a lot going on um, in houses, you know, and it can be really, really challenging um, for families. I think suddenly when services are kind of closed down, you know, whether it be probation projects um, you know, schools, you know, I'm, I'm thinking with some of the, the young people I work with, they, they come from big families, you know, and there might be kind of six or seven kids in, in, in the house, you know, and suddenly they're nearly all on top of each other. You know, you can you can see how that's such a massive challenge for for families. And I'm sure it's the same, you know, uh, across Ireland and across the world as well. So in a way, the the lockdown um, meant that ways of getting out of the house, uh, getting in a bit of space from you, uh, from your family or brothers and sisters, but also going to more positive places where you could go to a, a youth club or just get a, get away from the home environment. That intensified quite a lot of the problems. Um, one of the things that I think around uh, the world people have worried about is domestic violence. And maybe uh, young people uh could be exposed to that either as either victims or, or or seeing violence between their parents or carers. 
And do you think that that's been underreported or have you heard uh, that that's been a dimension of tensions and issues for young people you're dealing with? I, I, I think definitely emotional tension okay. within houses. I think, you know, parents, and especially parents who might have met me prior to COVID and, you know, there again, you have a good relationship with them. Uh, I think they'd be fairly forthcoming about saying, you know, speaking about tensions within the house, um, you know, and maybe young people kind of damaging furniture and different things like that. And, you know, a lot of kind of uh, verbal abuse, probably not so much physical abuse. I think that's probably been, been underreported. I, I, I've no doubt that is going on. I, I've no doubt that that is happening, but definitely kind of emotional abuse. That's, that's I suppose, a, a team, you know, especially over COVID, you know, would be something that parents would kind of speak about. Mm. Okay, I want to ask you both what you think the biggest challenges for you as probation officers has been over this COVID period. Um, let's stick with you for a moment, Connor. What's been your biggest challenge over the last year because of COVID? I, I think probably, um, I think the first lockdown was especially challenging, you know, because while in some ways it was a novelty, you know, and it was quite nice working from home and trying to, to kind of do reports and um, when you haven't met people previously and, and doing it by phone, I, f- I found that really, really difficult. And, um, you know, and I suppose learning new technology like Zoom and Microsoft Teams, you know, I wouldn't be very kind of IT uh, literate. So that, that was definitely uh, a challenge in the early days, but I think it's probably a good thing in the long run. And, um, I, I, I suppose, you know, even just kind of thinking, you know, while there are benefits to working from home and I, I've definitely enjoyed that piece, I think kind of not seeing your colleagues, you know, as often as you normally would, you know, I think there's that kind of collegiate experience, like that can be really nice when you're in an office and you, you do tend to kind of miss that, I think, as well. Mm-hmm. Kira, what about you? What's been your biggest challenge? I think just echoing what Connor said at the end, the the kind of isolation you have at home um, and I think setting the boundaries between, you know, your workspace, your work time and your home time, your self-care and everything else. Um, I think that is a challenge not seeing, not seeing people and kind of constant technology. You know, it's it's something, you know, I kind of always associate it with your leisure time, really. You come home and you might watch TV and stuff like that and work was just work with the computer but it seems like all the time there's use of technology and it's I don't think it's a bad thing but you need to take breaks from it as well but I think in terms of the workload in terms of the drug course um it's you know one of the challenges is is encouraging the clients to to kind of keep their head up when so many things have been taken away from them and that was again during the first lockdown but the services then even the community service have adapted so well they've they've been doing online zoom classes with our clients and you know like I said the school was sending out work like everybody has kind of come together to make sure that the clients did have something in place and some of them done really well we actually have some graduations set up for next week and the week after which to be able to graduate and to stay drug free during this time is amazing and you know some clients have, have fared really well so that's been really nice to see, but it was a challenge to, to encourage them to, you know, to keep going and stay in contact with us as well. Um, and then the other, I suppose, challenge would be the, the backlog in the sense of the reports. So between a period of time there from March to July, I think it was, there was a lot of block adjournments in the courts. Um, the main cases that they were hearing were custody cases. And a lot of our reports, we, we weren't really sure what was going on. Like we would have deadlines all the time to get reports in and we didn't know if they were going to be heard or not. So you're putting yourself under pressure to get them done and um, get your phone calls in. Some clients you don't have phone numbers for. So we just didn't really know what was going on. And then what happened was all those cases from about those three months then all of a sudden they're appearing then from you know September onwards you have to catch up on all those kind of reports so the the workload 
throughout the lock lo- the lockdowns has kind of become more demanding so it was more about kind of adapting to that because it was the same work we were doing beforehand but we had a period of time where it eased off a little bit so just catching up I think on, on the workload and, and I think just supporting the clients to um to try and stay positive I think has been the biggest challenges. Okay I'm interested that both in working with uh, drugs related uh, offenders and also with young people linking into community resources is vital to both jobs isn't it and just as you say you're missing contacts with your uh, probation colleagues it must be even harder to keep your community links going so how have you how have you kept the community aspects of your jobs alive do you want oh, yeah. <laughs> go. Both, um, both of you go. <laughs> I think from from my own point of view, I think um, contact with with just the, even our stakeholders has always been something we kind of need to keep going. Even our contact with guards, um, we're probably having more phone contact with them as well because I think we're worried about our clients and um, we're not really getting eyes on them as much. So just seeing, you know, are they coming to guard attention and, and stuff like that? Like we're having, it's important to have that that contact with the guards because our job is to work with you know offenders in the community so we need to know what they're doing in the community when we can't see them and but I think in terms of the community services in the drug court I mean that's a massive piece of what we do and like I said our nurse and she would have a lot of contact with the clinics residential services and you know a lot of them weren't taken clients for for beds and stuff like that for a while so she was constantly staying on top of it in terms of contact and she'd have a list she'd get through them every week what's the update where are you guys at um and then the same in terms of even counseling services the same thing we have our school then that was closed for a bit of time as well and um, so it was about seeing what other day programs are open and while some of them had closed most of them that closed had just adapted to the same way everyone else did by doing online classes. Um, so I think staying in contact with the community services was huge because you really needed them now more than ever when we were all at home. And I suppose we kind of probably learned more about what they were doing as well. Um through having all this contact and even the Zoom meetings and we would have had team meetings every week and sometimes we'd have um managers from those services come on and give us updates what are you doing how have you adapted to it is there anything you're offering that we should know about kind of thing so yeah it's been massive I think to stay in contact with the services okay Connor what's what's your community dimension like it's to be honest it's absolutely massive with the young people that I work with um you know and, and we, we were quite fortunate that I suppose the probation project while they were kind of similarly enough to ourselves, they, they had restrictions with COVID. They were really proactive around linking in with the younger people, you know, and I'm even kind of thinking at the moment, um, you know, they're all sending out work for the young people to do online, you know, by Zoom and different things. So, like, I think that's been absolutely terrific. And it kind of keeps the communication going between the, the projects and the young people as well, you know, and they don't lose that relationship that they've kind of worked you know, often work very hard to kind of build up. And, um, you know, I think I think equally the addiction piece, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, you know, we work very kind of closely with, um, you know, youth drug and alcohol services, you know, and they can, they stayed open all the way through um, the restrictions. So it was really good. So in some ways they, they kept meeting with the young people. And um, so there was that kind of um, channel of communication and they, you know, sometimes, especially maybe in, in the first lockdown when I maybe wasn't seeing the young people in person really at all, um, they they were, you know, and I think that was a great help because there was kind of near the eyes on the young people mm-hmm. and they were meeting with them and they were kind of seeing what the, the issues at hand were. Um, you know, and like I was saying earlier, you know, um, you know, there is kind of that flexibility in the YPP around where you're meeting the young people and, you know, you might meet them in residential units, you might meet them in youth clubs. You know, I, I, I would have met two young people there um, last week in a youth club. And, you know, it's absolutely, it's crucial because, you know, I think youth workers, 
in communities. They've got the, the knowledge on the ground about what's going on. But even more maybe than probation officers, they've got that relationship with the young people, mm. you know, because they're seeing them pretty much every day. So I think it's about tapping into to that resource. Um, you know, and equally in residential units, I think the workers, the staff who work in, in the units, they, they see the young people every day. So it's 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 absolutely it's crucial if you can have that body of communication with them. Mm. I like the fact you both referred to the eyes of the community uh, and in a way the community are the eyes and ears uh, engaging with uh, these people that's which is which is important I want to ask you uh, as a service um, clearly uh, it's been a really rough year I guess for the Irish probation service and and what do you think the biggest problems for the Irish probation service have been as they've tackled uh, the COVID-19 challenge Probably the IT. Um, I think we didn't, for, well, in the service, I suppose, and Connor will probably echo it as well, we didn't really work from home. Um, that wasn't something we we did. We we all had our office space or a court um, or the, a prison that we'd have to work in and remote working just wasn't something that we did. Um, so I think that the service were quite quick to kind of even realise that, look, this is we're in this for the long haul. And one of the biggest challenges was kind of equipping staff to be able to work from home, um, meaning, you know, providing staff with laptops, desktop, um, you know, mouse, keyboard, um, chairs, simple things like that, making sure people have an appropriate workspace um, at home. Um, and that was something that, you know, at the start, I, maybe it could have been a month or so um, where staff might not have had those things um, to be able to work from home. And, you know, we had to have like a token to sign in and, and all this kind of stuff. It was completely new to us how to be able to remote work. But I think it's something that we've actually have to really really quickly and we got those uh, the equipment quite soon from the start really and like we saw many probation officers all over the country so that was a big big job it's it, it there was only really seniors that probably had laptops and stuff like that at the time so even phones and um, we had we all had mobiles but we got upgraded phones with email access we we didn't have email access before that so that was handy and yeah, I, I think just changing everything, even the, the online stuff, our training, our training's online now as well. Um, and that's something we need to do as social workers. We're regulated by CORU. We have to do continuous professional development. So very quickly, our learning development unit had to kind of transform all of these training events onto Zoom um, and online platforms, which we were kind of saying, myself and Connor were saying before that, for the new staff coming in, that was probably quite hard because your induction period goes on for about three weeks and that's where you meet staff and everything else. And it was all online for our latest batch that came in. Um, but for other reasons, I think it's quite positive because training that could have been on in, say, just Dublin or the headquarters, you know, people traveling from other parts of the country would have to come up. So um, now they could just access it from home and. Um, and, you know, it was just access. So I think, yeah, and obviously the, the obvious one was equipping the building to make it safe for people to come back. There's There's been a lot put into that in terms of screens, hand sanitizer, one-way system, contact tracing, um, the return to work protocols we had to do and developing all the guidelines and everything. So there's been a lot. There's been a lot of challenges, I think. But I think the remote working was probably the one that we had to focus on the, the quickest and prioritise. And we've done that. Okay, Connor, do you see any additional challenges? Because um, I think Kira's probably covered, covered, yeah, covered, covered yeah, how the organisation yeah. has had to, <laughs> to tackle that. Anything additional that you see as being? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the IT aspect was huge, you know, because I think, you know, being equipped to maybe do court reports at home or do case notes, that was that was something that, you know, would have been an issue previously, you know, I'm kind of thinking kind of pre-COVID, you know, you, you might have been kind of rushing to an office after a meeting to finish a report, whereas now you can kind of do it in the comfort of your own home, you know, so there's greater flexibility. I think that's been huge. And I, I, I think the service, you know, like Kira said, it responded really quickly, I think, to, to meeting the needs of a pandemic, 
you know, which it, it can't have been easy, you know, putting up the screens and the general layouts. Um, you know, I'm even kind of thinking with with ourselves, and I'd say it's the same for, for Kira. You know, we're, we're, we're in pods. So, you know, you might be, let's say myself, I'm in YPP Southside, but I mightn't see, you know, half the team. You know, I, I might only see one or two of the other members of my team uh, because they're in my pod, you know, maybe two or three times a week. So it's that that's definitely been a challenge, but I suppose it's a response to what the situation is with, with COVID, you know, not having us all in the in the office at the one time. And a way you're taking responsibility for each other's health, aren't you? And that way of organising is, is is sensible. Um, do you think probation will go back to the way it was? I I don't think any office environment will. I, I think there's definitely a lot that's probably changed. And, um, you know, I think the, the working from home aspect, I, I think that, that flexibility, I, I can't see us losing that flexibility. But I suppose a massive part of our job, as Kira said earlier, it's, it's the face-to-face aspect. So I think, you know, we, we can't lose that. You know, we've got to be in the communities and seen by our clients and seen our clients, you know. But I think definitely the flexibility piece, you know, it, it can only be a good thing. Kira, what do you think the services learned from the crisis? I think, like kind of Connor was saying there, just in terms of that flexibility and stuff, I think that we need... Going forward, I suppose, you know, probation officers and social workers need to be supported that when things go back to normal, whatever normal means, that, you know, we're even provided a space, uh, provided with a space on our own learning from COVID-19 and how we've worked, how we've developed good practice and how we've adapted to the situation and use that to kind of how we manage services in the future it it kind of coincides with how we would work in the future in in the sense of what we've learned and i think it is what connor said is that digitization is is definitely kind of the way forward with a lot of different types of work um and i think that it's amazing that we have all these facilities and we're able to work this way and i could definitely see that as being part of you know our work in the future we still don't we're not very clear on how that looks i mean we we don't even know when we're going to come out of lockdown so it's hard to know but it's it's what connor said it's it's that kind of blended approach of remote working and face-to-face work you can't replace the face-to-face work when it comes to social work it's it's at the ethos of what we do um you know providing empathy for people that that compassion humanity it's not the same over the phone we can try our best but I think what the service has learned is that a blended approach might be you know part of that future and and kind of like like you were saying just the flexibility even for staff and it is that thing of kind of a work-life balance for us as well that that you know if we're more efficient getting certain things done remotely and and that works then it's the way forward but I think they'll learn that I'm sure there'll probably be a point where there'll be kind of feedback kind of questionnaires and stuff for staff and we've gotten some of those already as to what we're finding beneficial and things that we'd like to see change so I could see them kind of taking all that on really but I think it's just what we've learned very mainly is how how we do our work um and if anything all of this has highlighted how important the face-to-face is um and that you, you really just can't replace that with like you can't do everything remotely and and digital and I think from personally you appreciate the face-to-face then when you do it when I have interviews with clients I actually think I'm listening more um and I'm not trying to put myself in the bad books before I think I was a good listener I think I'm just I'm genuinely hearing them um a lot more when I'm seeing them and I'm trying to take as much in as I can because I know I'm probably not going to get to see them again I'll have to ask some certain things by phone so I think our, even our own approach maybe might have changed for some people okay well let's let's use that as a as a as a turning point in in our conversation because um you might have become uh more reflective in the way you are when you're with uh, offenders or your clients face to face. Um, I want to wonder whether it's made you more reflective uh, this experience of uh, COVID as, as people. And I'm wanting to ask what you do to escape from work pressures. Uh, you 
both in a way are now having to work from home a great deal more. So, Connor, what, what do you do to escape from being a probation officer? Well, I, I, I think exercise is massive. You know, getting out every day and trying to go for a walk. There's not probably much else to do at the moment in terms of exercise. I'm looking at Kira because we used to play every week uh, football, every Monday lunchtime. Uh, we kind of meet for, you know, probation officers for, uh, for a game. So I really do miss the football. But I think at least getting out, getting a bit of fresh air. Um, you know, I think especially if you're working from home on days when you're not maybe leaving the house, it's so important just to to get out for maybe an hour or so. Um, I think I think this was watching Netflix and watching different shows and, you know, watching football. Unfortunately, I'm a Liverpool fan. So uh, there's not been too much joy this year. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think, you know, trying your best to kind of stay in touch with family and friends. I think that's so important as well. Mm -hmm. You know, even if maybe you're not physically seeing them. What, what, what about you, Kira? I think um, pretty much what Connor said, um, the football, yeah, I'm, I'm a big, big football fan myself. And yes, unfortunately, Liverpool. Um, so well, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep very quiet about that. Because around, around the world, there will be people who will be quietly sorrowful, sorrowful with you. I know, I know. Thank God. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think the football was huge. We did used to play on Mondays. We we were actually due to go on a trip um, last April. We were going to Germany um, as part of like the European probation um, service. We were all coming together to do a tournament, and that didn't go ahead, which was which was sad. But we're hopeful. Um, so yeah, I I play football myself. I'm missing that as well. Um, but we're yeah fitness I'm I'm like doing online programs um walking a lot more wasn't it's not walking funny enough it wasn't something I, I used to do a lot I'm definitely more of a playing a sport kind of person um I play golf as well I'm really missing that that's our golf courses have been closed longer than any other courses in the in the world so um that's been tough um so yeah I think just getting outside it's much easier with the weather now starting to get better um Netflix, obviously, I mean, Netflix are raking it in at the moment, I think. But spending time, yeah, like I, I live with my partner and we have our dog. So I think spending more time with them and doing little things like playing games at home and even chess or reading or something. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily any new activities. There's not much to do, but it's more about getting back in touch with things I might have used to that I used to do. Has anything made you rethink your approach to work, Kira? Um. Yeah, I think I've always, in terms of my own work, I've, I think I've always been quite good at self cares. I think I've always had a good balance in the sense of keeping things separate. But in terms of my actual approach with clients, I think just kind of taking a lot more in of what they're telling us. I think that social work, like I said, it does involve, it's a lot of listening and, and you know, providing empathy for our clients. And I mean, we work with them for a reason because there's obviously challenges going on for them in their lives. So I think just taking a lot more things at face value, offering more supports, um, just, I think just, just listening more and just kind of being there for them and kind of doing what we can. I find myself when I'm doing an assessment and someone's telling me something's going on for them, then I'm like, okay, who could I refer them to? Um, like sometimes that might be something because of an assessment stage that we might wait until they're on supervision to do that piece. But you just really find yourself wanting to help people, um, you know, now more than ever, I think, because it's it's been a hard time for a lot of people. And if it's hard for us, I, I really just can't imagine what it's like for our clients. So I think just being more of, of, of a listening ear for our clients, really, and just being there for them and offering, look, if you need anything, you have the number. And, and because in a weird way, having that extra phone contact, maybe they're more likely to call us then than they would have if they only visited us in the office, you know. So it's a funny one, I think. I mean, lockdown is a shared experience, isn't it? Um, Connor, um, has anything made you rethink your approach to work? I, I think probably echoing what Kira said, you know, I, I think, you know, listening to the people that we work with and having, you know, a huge amount of empathy towards what they're going through. I think it's like what you said, John, you know, I think everyone, whether you're rich or poor, whatever background you're coming from, 
COVID, it's actually a shared experience, you know, but I think, you know, and, and I probably mentioned it earlier, um, you know, a lot of the the people that we work with, they, they can be living in large families and crowded living situations, you know, and it's so difficult for them. So I think having that kind of empathy, you know, and understanding about what they're going through, I think that's that's massive. Uh, I'd like to think I had it prior to COVID, but I think I'm, I'm probably doubly as aware um, with everything that we're all going through at the moment. Mm. Has lockdown changed you at all, Connor? I, I think it's probably made me more appreciative of, of what I had, you know, in the sense, you know, you take for granted, you know, if you wanted to go down the country on a break or if you wanted to go on a city break, uh, go and see Liverpool or go on holidays. I'm not saying I completely took it for granted, but it was something that you could kind of do, even going to the pub or going to a restaurant, whereas now, you know, I can't wait to kind of do those things. So I, I, I think not taking anything for granted, I think that's probably the biggest thing. What, what about you, Kira? What's changed um, you? I think I am probably a bit more laid back. Um, no, others might not agree, but I think I would have been somebody who um, does well with routine and with structure. And then with all this happening, um, I think it, it I mean, there is no structure um, really other than kind of being at home and going into the office or the court when we can. So I would have been somebody who liked to have things planned at the weekend or, um, you know, I, I don't know, I would have had like my golf tea time booked and all this kind of stuff. And things were always kind of just planned, I suppose. And now there are no plans. There, There is nothing to do. And I've definitely learned to just be more, I suppose, going in the sense of just living day to day because I think that's all we've actually been able to do for the last year and it probably took me a long time to to realize that as well and I think I actually like it to be honest I I kind of prefer you know this the spontaneity really of kind of what will we do this weekend and it doesn't have to be nothing there are plenty of things we can still do outside and or even having you know these zoom quizzes with friends or family and stuff like that and yeah I think that just kind of living more more day to day and and not so stuck in routine um and that kind of echoes what Connor was saying in the sense of not taking things for granted and just going with the flow I think a bit more well, we're coming towards the end of our of our time, uh, and it's all been a bit one direction so far. Uh, I've been the person sort of <laughs> putting you on the spot. And in these sessions, I've always said to uh, the people that I'm talking to, uh, have you got any questions you want to throw at me? It only seems fair to give you a chance to, to reverse the direction. So have you got any questions you want to put back to me? I suppose, how, how have you coped with COVID? Badly. <laughs> well, um, well uh, I'm lucky in the sense that uh, I've had a, a vaccination. So I... Congrats. Uh, I, um, I tell you quietly what I did. Well, now everybody's going there. I, I wrote a card and I found one that had got the most beautiful arch with uh, a rainbow arch with figures walking through. And I just wrote a, a message in the card to the person who I didn't know it was going to be, was giving me the vaccination. And I thanked that person. And um, I know that all around the world, the effort that health, our health workers, our frontline workers have put in. And um, I've been, um, I have one or two health issues myself and I uh, know that I was quite frightened about catching it. So the hope that flowed through me when they put the, the, the jab into me and the, all the science and the work and uh, the organisation that, that led to that, I'm very, very, very grateful for. Um, and all around Europe, you know, people are still facing death and sickness and long-term effects of COVID. So uh, I, I don't know about you, but it feels very much a life and death struggle at the moment, doesn't it? And um, life feels very raw 
And I think that that's something that in a modern life we try to put behind us sort of the these crude um, life choices. And I think lots of us have had to think very basic things about are we uh, making good decisions. Uh, and so I've, I wrote a card to the lovely lady that put an, a jab in my arm and thanked her. So that was a very basic thing that I felt I needed to do. Um, and it feels, it feels very fundamental, the process. And, and there are 8 million, billion of us on the planet. And one way or another, I suppose everybody is affected by it. So I've felt very humbled by being part of this pandemic, uh, as well as being frightened by it. So that's me trying to be <laughs> honest in, in responding as a human being to it. Kira, do you want to put me on the spot? Um. I suppose more from maybe a practical point of view, mm -hmm. you've obviously had a lot of conversations with, with probation officers and people in criminal justice mm -hmm. all over the world for the last while doing these kind of podcasts. So I suppose, is there any advice that you would give us as to other ways really that we could work with our clients to improve um, things going forward just based off, off things that you've heard from other, other practitioners? Yeah, I, I came across a, one probation officer who's been going for walks with his clients. Okay. Just doing it outdoors. What a brilliant idea. <laughs> and um, certainly uh, in the UK, um, one of the re first relaxations was being able to meet with somebody socially distanced outdoors, one person. Um, mm. And... I don't know about you, but I, I love meet. I love going for walks with people. Um, okay. So, and apparently his, his uh, client list was full <laughs> and people kept the appointments. That's quite nice, actually. That is nice because even if people wanted to get out and they didn't want to go by themselves, that's, um, yeah, it's, it, that's just the essence of humanity, really, isn't it? That's, yeah, yeah that's, thought, that is uh, good advice. Uh, and um, whether you could do, um, a drugs group uh, <laughs> on, on, a, on a hike. Well, actually, maybe you could. Maybe that's a, yeah. a, a, a new method we could discuss. Yeah, absolutely. Social distance, coffee, something. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm thinking more whether it could be mobile going up a mountain. It's perhaps more of a, <laughs> more of a stretch. I think you'd struggle to get me up that mountain, but I tried. Well, maybe if you were chasing a golf ball. Maybe. Okay. Right. Well, we're coming to the end and, you know, you will have loads of people from different parts of the world listening to this. And I'm wondering if um, you'd like to throw out any comments or advice that you might have for your colleagues around the world. Connor, what, what's your sign off uh, advice? I suppose the last 12 months, it's been really, really tough for all of us. So I, I suppose just stay positive. I mean, hopefully we're coming towards the end. I'm not going to say we're near the end because I, I, I think there's still a bit of a way to go, but we're definitely, you know, you can see kind of light at the end of the tunnel. So I, I suppose just stay positive, you know, and, and keep your heads up, you know, and keep, keep doing what you're doing and stay safe. Thank you. And, and Kira. Um, yeah, I would agree with what Connor said, really. It is just to kind of keep positive, um, keep going. I think that um, a lot of the time it's hard for us to remember that life did exist and was different before all of this. And it has been a long 12 months, but, you know, if it's 12 months of the rest of your life and if we can manage, you know, probably more than 12 months, but if we can manage to get through this, um, you know, we'll, there's, there's been a lot of challenges, but you, you know, you gain a lot of strength and resilience from going through something like this. So I think it's just to remember that, that there is other things in life and that it will end at some stage. We don't know when, um, but just like Connor was saying, just to stay positive and, you know, if anything, life might be better afterwards because we might appreciate everything that we had beforehand. And I know that people can quickly slip out of that perspective, but just to try and hold on to it, really, and just to keep supporting each other. And on that note, we're going to sign off. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, and to the audience out there, stay safe and hope you can join us next time. Uh, goodbye, and thank you, Kira and Connor, very much. 
All our podcasts are available on your normal provider. That's on YouTunes or Google under INCJ Podcasts. Goodbye, everyone. You have been listening to the INCJ Podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.